Before we launch into this episode of Grit and Growth, where we'll hear from one of the most prominent champions of entrepreneurship in Africa, I wanted to remind you that the deadline to apply for the Sea Transformation Program is fast approaching. This high-touch 11-month journey with Stanford starts in January 2023, and it includes a combination of face-to-face teaching, networking, and virtual learning. You'll connect and collaborate with a cohort of 60 other like-minded entrepreneurs from across your region, and the program is available at a fraction of its cost thanks to philanthropic contributions. So if you are a founder or CEO of a company based in Sub-Saharan Africa or South Asia with annual revenue of at least $300,000, please visit stanfordseed.co slash apply to learn more about this program and be sure to submit your application no later than June 1st. Now, I am thrilled to introduce to you someone else who is also on a quest to catalyze entrepreneurship across the African continent, none other than the illustrious Tony Elamelu. I wasn't the most intelligent in my class. I wasn't the most hardworking. And therefore, there must be luck in it that I'm who I am, what I became. There aren't many billionaires like Tony Elamelu who are both humble about their origins and committed to inspiring future billionaires. And I thought it was time to commit the second phase of my life to helping to impart humanity, to democratize that luck that I had growing up, to help expand access to opportunities. At Stanford Seed, we believe that when entrepreneurs succeed, everybody benefits. Their wins ripple out to customers, employees, and communities. And that's why we give entrepreneurs the tools to grow and scale their companies, because these businesses create sustainable wealth that can change the lives of many. That's a vision shared by Nigerian investor and philanthropist Tony Elamelu, named one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world for 2020. Tony is the chairman of United Bank for Africa and the founder of the Tony Elamelu Foundation. Through the foundation, he empowers entrepreneurs across the continent to solve Africa's biggest problems while creating economic and social value for their communities. Since it was established in 2015, the foundation has trained over 15,000 entrepreneurs across all 54 African countries. On this special episode of Grit and Growth, we're sharing a discussion between Tony and Stanford student Chisholm Obiokoye that took place as part of Stanford's View from the Top speaker series. Together, they explore his philosophy of African capitalism and his vision for the future of the continent. So without further ado, here is Tony Elamelu and Chisholm Obiokoye. Hi, Tony. It's so great to have you here. Thank you for being with us today. Good to meet you, too. <laughs> Um, You are one of the most celebrated and most decorated business leaders in Africa, and I would posit the world. So it's truly an honor to be able to host you at Stanford this afternoon. Thank you very much. We watched a video earlier um, where we learned a little bit about the foundation, which we'll speak about towards the later half of the interview. But we saw there that you are such a supporter and such an advocate of entrepreneurship, which isn't really a surprise because your parents were entrepreneurs. I'm curious to know how seeing them build businesses at a young age influenced you and impacted your journey. So I'm pleased and honored to be with you all today. Stanford, great university. Entrepreneurship is uh, in my DNA. I preach entrepreneurship. I encourage entrepreneurship. I also try to catalyze more entrepreneurs in Africa. Because in my own life journey, I've come to appreciate the significance and importance of entrepreneurship in transforming families, in transforming self, in transforming communities, in transforming countries, societies, and humanity entirely. And when we founded the Tony Elmelu Foundation, it was driven but the need and urgency to help catalyze development in Africa at a scale that is sustainable, realizing further that entrepreneurship is the way to that. And I've come to realize that this journey of entrepreneurship, in fact, not just entrepreneurship, everything in life, discipline is critical for success. And I've come to see, and I preach this too, 
that the journey entrepreneurship is not a linear journey. It's up and down. But if you're tenacious, if you're resilient, you cross the finishing line. So those are part of the early learnings from my parents, my mom, my dad, long ago told us. And the reason is, it's in my brain to date, that if you earn a dollar and you're unable to save, if you earn a billion dollars, you will not save anything. So that, for me, is the first lesson in capital formation. Capital formation starts from savings. If you do not save, you don't have money to invest. If you don't invest, you remain where you are. And so these lessons have helped me in this journey of entrepreneurship. So let's fast forward a few years. You graduate um, from university with a a bachelor's and a master's degree in economics. You then proceed to become one of the youngest bank branch managers in Nigeria, typically a job reserved for people who are in their 50s or 60s. You become the managing director of one of the biggest banks in Nigeria. And then 2005 comes around and you are being asked to help lead what becomes like the biggest merger in Nigeria's corporate history. What were some of the challenges that you faced during that time and which leadership principles did you stay rooted in as you were guiding this process? So first, you saw United Bank for Africa as almost 70 years old as an institution and uh, kicked and set ways of doing things. And we were coming from a bank that was so strong in service delivery and technology, young people, etc. So a bank with size of uh, less than 1,800 people and the United Bank of Africa had about 12,000 staff. These 1,800 younger, technologically advanced, and this other one (laughs) older, and very big bank. So it was not easy integrating, because as you see in corporate majors, the legal combination is not the issue. The difficult part is the people integration, the culture integration. And if you can see from history, most corporate institutions It takes so many years to integrate people and culture. And if you do not integrate people and culture properly, you lose the major value levers. And so we were mindful of this and wanted to make sure we were able to merge, integrate. And this is a financial institution that was like, you merge, they want customers, don't care whether they want to be served. Same institution, they moved on. So it was tough integrating our people, merging our people, merging cultures, old cultures uh, set in their ways and a vibrant younger culture. But therein lies the interesting aspect of the combination of the job. I say to people, my elder brother who is uh, seven years older than me, he doesn't have gray hair. I have gray hair. My gray hair started from the the merger (laughs) because uh, (laughs) making it work serving your customers, making sure that everyone in the universe of the institution, which was, uh, we had 428 branches at the time, that uh, it was the same level of service across board. Customers of standard trust brand that were used to a certain level of service delivery, you would not want them to come to the new institution and have a drop. So we just had to make sure that service we put our customers first. And that's why today United Bank for Africa, which interestingly has grown from a one country bank to a bank that operates in 20 African countries with presence also in Paris, London, recently Dubai, and the only African bank that operates in the US with a, as a deposit taking institution. Today, United Bank for Africa serves over 35 million customers in Africa and still growing. We're helping to simplify payments on the continent. We're helping to orchestrate trade transactions, intra-Africa trade transactions. Prior to this time, Africa did not trade with and amongst itself. We believe the reason Africa didn't do this is because payment issues 
because of uh, even infrastructure, and most importantly, financial inclusion. We're trying to make sure that everyone, a continent with over one billion people, the banking population is not so high. So to us, it's not just about banking or offering banking services, it's about what we call democratization of access to financial services. It's about financial inclusion. So I'm making sure that almost everyone in markets where we're operating have access to banking facilities. We believe that in Africa we have informal economy that is very large. And all of us should be involved in trying to formalize the informal economy. You alluded to this a little bit earlier. There's a lot of innovation happening in the financial services industry, a lot of tech disruptors, and all many of which are working towards that goal of democratizing access to financial services. How do you see the company collaborating or even competing with some of these disruptors, particularly thinking about new technologies like cryptocurrencies, peer-to-peer -peer payments, et cetera? For us, or for me at this point, I'm not so much of a bank. However, as a group, we realize the importance of technology. These two disruptions that we see in the world is real. And in Africa in particular, thanks to the, the population of our continent, we know that we have to catch up. If we don't catch up, we're going to be left behind. And for businesses, they don't need a bank. They just need a facilitator for payments. You know, they need a facilitator that follows their lifestyle. So, and banking is changing. It's changing from the way we used to know banking so many years ago. I tell you, at United Bank of Africa, I told you earlier that we have 35 million customers. All of 2004, UBA celebrated was the first bank in Nigeria to have 32 ATMs. 32 ATMs in all of, yes. in all of Nigeria, in all of Nigeria. And it was a major marketing tool that we have 32 ATMs. And then 97% then of our customer transactions occurred in the banking hall. Today, UBA opens about 500,000 accounts every month. And these accounts, these accounts, 95% are opened online, not in the banking hall. <laughs> so things have changed. And by the way, it will change further. I mean, technology is disrupting a lot of things, not just in the US, not just in the West, but everywhere. So we, we live in a very, in a new world, and every one of us is uh, adopting and adapting fast to, to the new world, or will be left behind. You mentioned energy a little earlier, which makes me nervous because it seems as though you're reading my mind because that's where <laughs> I want to go next. Um, last year, the Africa Energy Chamber recognized you as one of the 25 most influential individuals in shaping Africa's energy sector. I'm curious to know, especially knowing that at Stanford, sustainability and renewable energy and energy more broadly is a really important subject that gets studied here and talked about a lot. What are the most pressing issues and solutions being discussed right now as it relates to energy in Africa? And also, I would love to know a little bit more about the work that you're doing, I think, I believe, through Transcore to address this. So access to electricity is extremely poor in Africa. Less than 35% of our people have access to reliable electricity on the continent. This is why most, I'm sure you, Stanford, you must have seen this in your business uh, research studies, that most small and medium scale enterprises on the continent die. They don't succeed. And single most important factor for this due to poor access to electricity. So to us as a group, we believe in the concept and philosophy of African capitalism, which is uh, a call on the private sector to play some role in developing our continent. It's a, a realization that the private sector has a role to play in developing the continent. And in practicalizing this, and not just speaking to it, we decided that the power sector was critical for us to invest in. And so we mobilized resources and invested in this space. So as the world mobilizes 
towards a more inclusive society as the world mobilizes through a more prosperous world. I always like to remind people that we cannot have that prosperity across the world if we not deal with the issue of access to electricity on the African continent. So it's a major, for me, it's not just an investment, you know, a commercial investment, it's what we should be doing in the 21st century to help improve access to electricity. Those who have capital should look at investing in Africa, there are opportunities there. And those who have voices, let's keep shouting to attract attention <laughs> of those who have deep pockets so that collectively all of us can make a difference in the Africa. I want to spend some time on what you mentioned earlier, Afro-capitalism, which you are known across Nigeria and other countries as well, have been a strong proponent of, and you've detailed here. I'm curious to know why you believe that Africa needs to take a unique approach to capitalism. Well, it's not a unique approach to capitalism, per se. It's, for me, a realization. Okay, so at times there's this uh, entitlement mentality that people have, okay? We should be helped, we should be supported, we should be developed. (laughs) But for Christ's sake, I mean, it can't be like that forever. We need to help ourselves too. So it's a realization that come. The private sector has also grown, is growing. We need government to prioritize, we need government to create the right environment for private sector to keep doing well. But the private sector also must be sensible and reasonable and conscientious in how we do things, okay? We should invest in a manner that helps to catalyze prosperity. We should invest in a manner that helps to create social equity, social wealth. We should invest in a manner that helps to create inclusiveness. So this is not just about a new form of capitalism or the other. It's more about how the fact that the private sector should play a role in helping to develop the economy. And let's stop blaming others for our woes. Let's stop blaming others for everything. Let's lead and hopefully they follow. And I've seen it happen. In advanced society, again, the meeting I attended in LA, it all had different names today patient capital, impact investing, shared prosperity, mutual destinies. We just need to invest in a manner that's not just about profits for the investors. We should invest in a manner that creates mutual benefits for everyone, for the investors, for communities where you do business in, for society at large, The fact that we do what we do at the Tony Melu Foundation, committing 100 million US dollars to supporting the next generation of African entrepreneurs, it's not because we have so much money. But we also know that some of the basic needs we want to have are provided. So when we say we'll give non-refundable seed capital of $5,000, and when we do so, and to date over 16,000 Africans have benefited from that program, it is not to encourage laziness, no. But we know when San Francisco, where in tech uh, environment, we know some started with less than $5,000, but today they've grown big. So we just want to give young Africans access, opportunity, opportunity to prove their concept. Instead of people keeping their monies in bank accounts abroad, why don't you bring your money to invest in the electric sector on the continent? You make more money, but you also impact society in a more positive way. That is the the entire essence of it. Now, Tony, typically when people retire from very high stress jobs, such as being the CEO of one of the largest banks in Africa, they take a vacation. Um, You instead decided to found a company, Heirs Holding, and also the foundation that you've alluded to. I'm curious, this was a few years ago, I'm curious about what you saw happening like in Nigeria or beyond that at that time that drove, that was the impetus for you to develop this foundation. We did two things. When I retired in 2010, 12 years ago, 
we decided to create a family office, which was to some extent novel in our part of the world. And we said the family office will be quite catalytic in the kind of investment that we make. Hence this philosophy of African capitalism. And decided the sectors that we consider very important that could help to move the needle, power. When Nigeria and Africa is endowed with a lot of resources, yet we do not have the ability to process all of this and convert them to the state that they can become valuable to our people. So we said energy from an integrated point of view and across the value chains. We looked at healthcare sector and we said health is important, that we need to invest in the healthcare sector. And so far, so good on that. The second thing was the foundation. I thought that um, my story has been one of um, this element of luck in my story. <laughs> this element of being at the right place at the right time. <laughs> I wasn't the most intelligent in my class. I wasn't the most hardworking. And therefore, there must be luck in it that I'm who I am, what I became. And I thought um, I had risen very rapidly, done quite a lot. And I thought it was time to commit the second phase of my life to helping to impart humanity, to democratize that luck that I had growing up, to help uh, expand access to opportunities. And I've been inspired by what I see around the world. You know, you look at Steve Jobs, for instance, you know, and his background. And I ask myself, Steve Jobs were an African. If he was an African in Nigeria, would he have been able to succeed? The scale and magnitude that he succeeded. So it's all of this that drove me to say, you know, I don't know what I would say to God if I do not create or help to create more Tony Melus on the continent of Africa in the first instance. And that was what drove my wife and I at the time to decide that um, we should commit 100 million US dollars to helping to identify, support, and empower the next generation of African leaders and to do it at the scale and magnitude that's never been done before. So my final question for you, you seem to be a nation in and of yourself. Through the foundation, you've worked with local governments, international governing bodies um, to help move capital where it's most needed. And so I'm sure you've heard it asked many times before, Nigeria is now in its election season. I will join the chorus. Why aren't you running for president? (laughs) Oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. When she was asking me what she was going I think uh, first is um, when I look around, I know the potential that we have as a continent and as a people. I see opportunities. I know that um, life can be a lot better for people, and oftentimes you feel the urge to show interest in how we are governed and how things happen. I realize also that all of us cannot be in the political space, but I know well that evil succeeds or tries in the world when good people keep quiet. So I say to myself, Just the way I'm committed to entrepreneurship, the way I'm committed to helping to empower young Africans, we should support the emergence and orchestration of good governance across the continent. Because I think that is what has held us down as Africans. So for me, it's not just about Nigeria. It's about many countries, many countries on the continent. So I am interested in good governance. And I know that what we preach and advocacy and everything we do, trying to encourage young people, would not succeed if the political space or the leadership is not good. So mine is for to continue to encourage the evolution of 
the political process that we won through our good leadership and two, ensure that our leaders stay accountable. That process is not there yet, but we are working together. And I, again, it's one area when I was in Washington, I said to political leadership here too, that it should be a concerted effort. It should encourage people on the continent to do what is right. Even as we also from the continent continue to speak and have on good governance and accountability. That was amazing. Thank you so much. We at Stanford Seed applaud Mr. Elamela's efforts to create opportunities for Africa's next generation of entrepreneurs. There's a lot to learn from Tony's decision-making process, like how he approaches disruption and invests in Africa's future. If you'd like to learn more about the Tony Elamelu Foundation, visit the link in our show notes. And if you're interested in hearing more talks like this one, View From the Top has its own podcast feed and is also available on YouTube. This has been Grit and Growth with the Stanford Graduate School of Business, and I'm your host, Darius Teeter. If you like this episode, leave us a review on your podcast app. And again, if you are a business owner in Sub-Saharan Africa or South Asia, and you're looking to grow your company exponentially, be sure to apply for the Seed Transformation Program by June 1st. Visit stanfordseed.co slash apply to learn more. We hope to see you in the classroom in the new year. Grit and Growth is a podcast by Stanford Seed. Lori Fuller and Erica Amoake Ajay researched and developed content for this episode. Kendra Gladich is our production coordinator, and our executive producer is Tiffany Steves, with writing and production from Andrew Gannam and sound design and mixing by Alex Bennett at Lower Street Media. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. <laughs>